He will let me know. He's in charge of me. What does a waterfall sound like? What's the sound of a waterfall? That's my emergency. Good morning. Welcome to the University Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. My name is Paula Despang. My pronouns are she and her and hers. And um, I'm your service leader this morning. Yay, lucky me. So join us in our shared sacred space now. Settle in, get comfy in your chair, and turn off your electronic devices so they don't make noise that distracts anyone, including you. Um, if you're on call somewhere, put that thingy on vibrate. Uh, if, if we have any committees that need to make reports, this is the time and the place. Hello, everybody. I'm David McElroy. Hey. Hey, Roy. <laughs> um, tomorrow, uh, 6.30, here at the church, is the men's support group. So we'd love for you to come out. And if you don't know anything about it or want to know more about it, I'm here after, and we can talk about it. Uh, it's a potluck or bring your own. So um, those of you who are men, come on down. Good morning, Margie with membership. We had a short-lived committee of fun for a while and um, just stepping in just for a moment for that, I went ahead and made a reservation at Hamburger Mary's, I know it's short notice, for next Saturday, seven o'clock. If you're not familiar with Hamburger Mary's, you should go to their website. They're just, it's a hoot. It's a fun place to go to. They have great burgers and uh, over on Church Street downtown. So I. It is. And uh, so if you're interested, let me know. First come, first serve. I'll put you on the uh, Luke and I are the first two. So there's eight more spots. Hi, this is John Irie. And I am letting you know that the Dungeons and Dragons game, which is normally scheduled for next Sunday, February 11th, will be canceled. And we will be resuming on our normal schedule after that. So Super Bowl Sunday, there's no Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know when the Super Bowl was. I told somebody today to have a Super Sunday. And I was thinking, I wonder if it's a Super Bowl, because I'm not a sports fan, just in case you were wondering. So I'm here for a couple of things. Um, first, quarterly meeting next week. There's been lots of stuff going out. Read the minutes and the bylaws. We're going to vote. So please come. Um, ministerial transition team, we are meeting tomorrow night at 5 o'clock on Zoom. And if you haven't done your ministerial transition survey, now is the time. We need to get it in if you want your opinion heard. I mean, if you don't care, that's okay, but we'd like to really hear from everybody. There's some thoughtful questions, so please take your time and do that. And last but not least, passionate communication. If you have trouble talking with your family members or friends about politics and religion, come try to learn some tips, because I, I say that to people so often, and they say, oh, we can't talk about that. But if we don't learn how to talk about it, we're never gonna get any closer to the other side or, or, or whatever. So please consider coming and inviting your friends. We've got some registrations already, a couple from First You, because they advertised it. So we can't have more of them than there are of us. Huh? Yeah, it's here. Sunday, February 18th. I might have to talk to John after church, and we'll figure out how both our groups can coexist. <laughs> All right.
Hey guys, Derek, on behalf of Facilities and Grounds and... <laughs> did, did you happen to notice that we've beaten Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas in basketball ball this year? <laughs> anyway, so um, pretty good. Uh, yes, a um, couple of things. One, work day, uh, two weeks from yesterday. Um, the project is this um, experiment we had in ground cover isn't working so well. So if anybody has like expertise in what's that called, horticulture? Right? So they can help us with this stuff. Second, the IT project's kicking off, and we need, <clears throat> we need a volunteer, somebody who's like savvy and wants to get dirty in IT, right? Can help us out. So look me up, right? You have to know something about IT? It would help. <laughs> okay? All right? Here we go. Thanks. Hi, Lori Hospitality. Uh, I want to thank everybody who volunteered for coffee. I now have volunteers for the next few weeks. We're in good shape there. Um, for the congressional, uh, congregational meeting, I, we will be providing a snack to hold you over so you can stay and, and make your vote be heard. Um, and last week I announced we were going to have a potluck on the 18th. That doesn't work for me. We're going to move that to the 25th. And Due to a number of requests, we're going to try to do a vegan, vegan, a ve vegetarian one. So vegetarian means nothing that an animal has been killed for, or you can make a vegan dish which has no animal in it at all, no milk, no cheese, no eggs, no honey. No honey. <laughs> so um, you know you can make one or the other, and uh, but just try to think about something that you can do that's one of those two, and that's what's going to be on the 25th. Thank you. Lindsay Stroh for the auction committee. The auction will be on Sunday, April 14th. Everybody who went last year and had a good time, it was a very good time. And it will be a lot of fun again this year. I am looking for auction committee members. Um, Sarah Sullivan and I are co-chairing it, and we have a fun entertainment idea already, so it's going to be a good time. But um, by next week, I hope to have the schedule of when we need your donations and uh, the information to get on to registering on the website, because that's the way to do it, register on the website. Some items will be bid on and be gone before even the auction day, because people bid online for things, like the home parties and stuff. But we'll have more information next week. But save April 14th for a very good time. Pardon me? OK. <laughs> all of us are prepared people who will have that all done already. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am James with um, RE. Uh, so I wanted to let you guys know about a upcoming program with RE. We are starting a coming of age program uh, coming up. Um, I wanted to give you just a very short sort of idea of what it's like and then tell you where you can get more information. So uh, it will involve uh, three parts. It will be, I should start with the age. It's um, going to be initially available for everyone in the middle and high school class. Um, and then in the future it will be more for people at the beginning of uh, middle school. But it's going to have three parts, um, a service or social justice project, a belief and value statement, and an independent study project. It's going to be very cool. It's going to be very individualized to each child. Um, and if you'd like more information, you can email me. Uh, there will also be a little bit more information given at the quarterly congregation meeting. And then in a few months, uh, I plan on having a meeting specifically to go ahead and give everyone more information and answer any questions they have. So nice little FYI, and you have three different ways to get more information. Thank you. Um, and talking about the auction reminded me of one thing. We did not put it in our notable news. Um, the first use auction is going on right now. Theirs is only online. But if you would like to go to the UU or the One U website and check it out, you may find something there you'd like to buy. We're not in competition. You know, they're having their auction now. You could also get some good ideas of what to donate. Theirs is all services this year. So it might give us some good ideas. So check it out and then come back with creative ideas for ours. 
And, um, and we can support them too. We're all about building more Unitarian Universalists in the world. So. I have two items. The first is um, this being cold and flu and COVID season. If you are feeling ill at all, please stay home. I'm not talking about when your allergies are acting up. That's not contagious. But when, when there's uh, microorganisms that are creating havoc for you, let's don't bring them here and create havoc for others. So the other, you can watch, you can watch on Zoom. You can watch on, you know, um, YouTube. That's right, YouTube. <laughs> I knew it was somewhere out there. Facebook, something, I don't know. So, and the other thing I have to say is that uh, I've found a key ring, one side uh, celebrating Disney, M Mickey, and Minnie, and the other side celebrating Spider-Man. If this is yours, please come, come and claim it. This is Chloe McElroy's. Could you make sure she gets that? Okay. Well, see, that was easy. See, one whole item completed. I love this. My opening words come from the book of Psalms, chapter 120, verses 6 and 7. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And our opening music this morning, I'm going to turn over to, oh, I love this hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, 188. Um, please stand as you are willing and able. We know this one. We have sung this before. Um, it is around. And so we will sing it through twice all together and then twice as a round. And when we do the round, I will lead this half of the room first and then this other half of the room, just follow Gary. <laughs> Come in when he comes in, hang on. Okay. Come, come, whoever you are, wandering, worshiper, lover of believing, of these no care of and of despair. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of living, as is no care of and of despair. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, Wanderer, worship, lover of living, as is no care of our noble despair. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worship, lover of living, as is no care of our noble despair. Come yet again, come. Come yet again, come. Who likes singing in rounds? Good, we're going to organize more of that. Our chalice lighter this morning is Chase, whose pronouns are he and him. He's 13, and he rode his bike. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. 
and we affirm our relationship to each other. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another. And I would bring a special welcome to our visitors today. Yay, you're here. And so uh, come again anytime. The door is open. We have, we have an honest-to-God minister half of the time, but the other half of the time, we have other speakers from other denominations and from academia and from uh, uh, social justice organizations that we support. So come many times, see who we really are in depth. Um, and say hi to everybody online. There's the cameras back there. Hello. Welcome to you all too. I hope it's warm and toasty and you have a cup of tea with you. I do. We also share joys and concerns in this congregation. It helps us to know each other. And um, you're welcome to come to the microphone and s say your piece. If you, don't wanna, if you can't walk or don't want to walk that far, I'll bring the microphone to you. Not a problem. Knowing that whatever you say into this mic is going out to the internet where it will live forever. Good morning. Um, I have grandchildren, and I wonder what this world is going to be like when they're 30, 40, 50 years old. What I can do right now is I collect all my little batteries and light bulbs and small appliance, you know, I mean small um, things, and I take them out to the recycling place in Seminole County. So I have got a bag of that I'm going to take out, and I'll wait a couple weeks. So if next Sunday anybody wants to bring things to me, um, I will take them. Now, I have a very small car. I don't have a pickup. I can't do big things. I'm talking little things. But the, you, it, you'll be surprised how many little things are around your house. A small box. <laughs> okay, that would be fine. All right. Hi there, I'm Paul Enschelmeyer, uh, long ago uh, member of this church, before the second building was built even. Uh, but I moved to, back to my home state of Illinois uh, about eight or nine years ago and get down here in the wintertime for a week or two and whenever I do, I stop by here. Good to see everybody. I have a joy. Um I went to the park today. I have a, a serious concern, and that is um, my mother has recently, recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and um, it's not too much of a surprise at this point, but she seems to be going downhill rather quickly, and it's not great. I usually just sit and listen, you know, when these joys and concerns are shared, but actually I wanted to share one with you today, and that is that uh, yesterday, day before yesterday actually, day before yesterday, I officiated at a memorial service. And uh, it was the most uh, interesting and exciting memorial service I've been involved in for a long time, and it kind of has connections with the Unitarians. It was for Katie Moncrief, some of you may know Katie, Katie's Landing up on the Wakiver River was named after Katie. And uh, she was very involved in, uh, in the Central Florida community as an environmental activist. It was one of the co-founders of Friends of the Wakiver River. And uh, she also at one time, this goes way back, you know, to the, uh, to the late 1960s, was the secretary at First U. And, uh, and so she was very much involved with a lot of the things that the Unitarians were doing. She also had connections with the Episcopal Church and, uh, and uh, really kind of considered herself an agnostic, I think, but, but felt that she had you know, a, an extreme obligation to make the world a better place. And she did it until she was 98 years old. 
which is pretty impressive and pretty amazing. And it was actually at uh, First U that she met her husband. And uh, it was her third husband, actually. And uh, interestingly, when I put together the life sketch, she wanted all of her names there. So it was, it was Katie, Kessler, Peltzer, Teal, Moncrief. And, and her rationale was that, uh, you know, while some of these early ones hadn't worked out so well, there were very precious and beautiful moments in them. And she didn't want those to be forgotten. And whereas a lot of people would, you know, sweep that kind of thing under the carpet. And uh, so I thought that was uh, very interesting. And, and the way she met her husband was they used to have a, a dance once a week that was sponsored by, for, by One You. And uh, it came to the attention of the minister at that time that uh, liquor was being brought in and people were surreptitiously kind of imbibing. And it wasn't quite the atmosphere that they wanted to have. And so they thought they needed to get to the bottom of it. And she was new to the, to the job and uh, didn't know everybody. So they thought, we'll send her as a spy to kind of find out what's going on. And of course, being a good spy, she had to mix in with the people, you know. And uh, so she danced. and. Uh, began dancing with this, uh, this man kind of repeatedly, a guy named Russ, and uh, he was a divorcee who had kids, and she was a divorcee who had kids, and uh, anyway, then they got married and uh, lived together for more than 40 years. So it's a quite, a, quite an interesting story. Anyway, it's connected to the Unitarians, and uh, it was one of the most uh, high honors that I had that she wanted me to officiate at her uh, at her uh, memorial service, and I had officiated at her husband's as well. We were very good friends, and uh, so anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. The joy about somebody's memorial service. <laughs> so my joy is, um, I've got three sons. Richard's up in Detroit with my two grandchildren and his wife. And then I've got uh, son number two is Frank, lives out in California with his wife. And, they're, and the other number three lives nearby. And uh, they're all going to be coming, converging on my house uh, uh, pretty soon. They're going to stay for a week. So I'm excited. Going to be doing a lot of cooking and, and uh, parties. And, and I hope I don't have to get in between any arguments and, and fights, but the boy, yeah, anyway, excited, thanks. Josephine's excited that her mommy has a baby in her belly. Aww. Due Mar March 1st. It is exciting. We haven't had a congregational baby in a while. Yeah. I have two from online. Uh, Michael Richards. Um, just wanted to say that I miss you all. My eyesight is slowly getting better and plan on being in church next Sunday. Thanks to all, all who have been in touch with me. And uh, Rachel Wisner, or is it Wisner? Wisner? I've been staying home the past few weeks with the flu. Oh, I received news this week that my father was diagnosed with leukemia. He has started chemotherapy at UPenn in Philadelphia. Please keep him in your thoughts. And I thought there was one more. Oh. Yes, one more. I have a joy. This is from Bridget Burke who's a visitor with us, I believe. Um, I have a joy. Yesterday, my spouse and I went to Megacon and met William Shatner from Star Trek, as well as Carrie Hughes and Robin Wright from Princess Bride. Now, that would have been fun. And we got their autographs. The lines were long. My feet still hurt, but it was worth it. Hi, I'm Dee. I just wanted to say uh, I planted tomatoes on the 25th of November. And they are in bloom. They have little yellow flowers that become tomatoes. And I have four varieties. I have a black prince, which is a dark red. I have a plum tomato. I have a cherry tomato orange called sun gold. It probably won't share a lot of those. I eat them before I get in the house most of the time. <laughs> yeah. And then some uh, big beef, regular red tomatoes. And they should have, I should have tomatoes in a week or two. So thank you. 
and I'll share them freely, and you'll find me there in McElroy Row. <laughs> Hold a moment of silence for all those joys and concerns shared and for those that were held privately. Thank you. James is here with a time for all ages. Hello again, everyone. I'm actually going to start with something I forgot in committee moments. I just want to let everyone know there's a box of free stuff over there from um, when we were cleaning out the office. So there's a bunch of spirit play packs that have like little stories and items to go with the stories as well as uh, curriculum and miscellaneous things. So if anyone wants that, it's free. Feel free to take it. <laughs> so... Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to do another one of my famous interactive stories. So if anyone would like to volunteer to come participate in this story, feel free to come up. Anyone can volunteer. You don't have to be a kid. You can be a kid at heart. All ages, yes. Awesome, here we go. <gasps> Hello, welcome. <laughs> Okay, now you guys may notice that I am carrying a mysterious um, pile of sticks in my hands. Um, this is actually a prop, and um, I will need whoever is going to play the father to let me know, and I will hand them the pile of sticks. Okay, you are the stick holder. There we go. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to read the story, and you guys are going to act it out as I read it. Does everyone understand? Okay, so here we go. A certain father had a family of children who were forever quarreling amongst themselves. No words he could say did the least good, so he cast about in his mind for some very striking example that should make them see that discord would lead them to misfortune. One day, when the quarreling had been much more violent than usual, and each of the children was moping in a surly manner, he asked one of them to bring him a bundle of sticks. You just point to it. <laughs> Sorry, I should have been more clear, I apologize. <laughs> then handing the bundle to each of his children in turn, he told them to try to break it, the whole bundle. You can just do the whole bundle. But although each one tried their best, It will be impossible for your enemies to injure you. But if you are divided amongst yourselves, you will be no stronger than a single stick in that bundle. Thank you, everyone. You can set your sticks on the table. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to have even more interaction because I'm going to ask the audience here, uh, what do you think the general lesson was for this, so I know some of it was explicitly said in the story, and how do you think that, that we can apply that in our everyday lives? And I see we already have a hand. Here we go, my morning exercise. Patrick Henry, united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you, and we have another hand. Hi, Gina, star of the show. Um, I um, just wanna say that just like the sticks, um, the government and corporations do not make this country, we do, and together we will stand strong against those who try to um, hold us down and affect us. Thank you so much. Oh, there we go. Stick together. <laughs> and you'll be stronger. Thank you. Oh, got another hand. We are better together. Thank you. I'm just remembering the title of last week's sermon, which was um, 
you, it, it's scary to go it alone or you can't go it alone or don't go it alone, something like that. So just remember to reach out if you feel like you're alone, find somebody to go with you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you guys so much. And I hope you enjoyed the story and enjoyed the lesson. And the actors. And the actors. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Our speaker this week. Oh, oh no, there's an interlude and offering first. The choir is going to sing for us. No? Oh, it's. It's Gary. <laughs> Actually, this is uh, congregational singing, so uh, if you could, the words will be up here. I think we don't know this one, so uh, Janet will play it through once, and then uh, we'll all sing it, all four verses, I believe. 297. Okay. Star of truth but dimly shines behind the veiling clouds of night. But clearly searching I divine some partial glimmer of its light. The certainty for which we crave no mortal ones can ever know. Uncharted waters we must pray and face whatever winds may blow. Though for sail harbor we may long, we must not let our courage fail. And though the winds of doubt blow strong upon the trackless ocean sail, from honest doubt we shall not flee, nor the inquiring mind. For where the hearts of all are true, upon the wraith we shall find. Okay, Paul wanted me to help sing the children out, so here we go. We love you and bless you and send you on your way. We love you and bless you today and every day. Our speaker today is Elder Jim Coffin. Morality, war, military. Well, these are heavy topics. Anybody ever touched one? Yes. So he's going to throw some stuff out there for us to think about. But you should know a little bit more about him. Until we had a minister of our own, he was really a frequent flyer in this pulpit. Uh, you know, <coughs> once every two months or three months or something like that, pretty often. And, and he organizes his thought. He's got thinking brain, and he uses it here, and I love that about him. And recently, he had some fun with his family. Two of his children were born in Australia when he was there and did some of their growing up there. And uh-huh. And recently, they celebrated Australia Day, which happens every year so at their house. So they had a good time getting together and eating foods that are oh, probably Vegemite, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> See? Yeah. It's not like I'm completely... Oh, I'm a little bit cosmopolitan. So anyway, so he had that fun, and I wanted you to know something about him besides that he's a retired minister from somewhere else. So back to you. It gets even a little more complicated than Paula suggested in that my wife is an Australian too, and so of the... Uh, you know, the father, the mother, and the three boys, there's a majority who uh, were Australian-born. 
And uh, so we have to treat them very well because they have the upper hand, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we did have Vegemite. And, uh, and we also had some imported cherry ripe candy bars. And uh, they don't have them everywhere in the United States. And the reason they don't, I think, is because the Australians knew that if they ever started supplying them here, and then there was a supply chain problem and they couldn't get them here, they'd have such an influx of people trying to immigrate to Australia <laughs> that they would not have uh, you know, any, any way to handle that kind of crowd. You know? So that's why they kind of keep it to themselves, you know, only those who are on the inside. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you this morning about, uh, about war and, uh, and military and uh, the morality of it all. And this is really kind of a personal journey because I've sort of wrestled with this from the time I was about 18 years old and registered for the draft, which we had to register for back then. And uh, that was a long time ago. And uh, at that time, we talked a lot about the morality of war. There was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of protests. There were a lot of people who were famous people who were speaking up. Martin Luther King wasn't just an activist for... Uh, racial issues, uh, civil rights issues, but he was very much an activist about the war and also uh, the uh, war on poverty, the, uh, the need to deal with the poor. Anyway, uh, we talked about those things a lot back then and then it kind of, you know, has drifted off the radar screen and we don't talk about it so much anymore. Maybe in the past few months since October 7, uh, we've talked about it a bit more but one of, the, uh, one of the things that works to our advantage in terms of not having it uh, affect us perhaps quite as deeply is that we've tended to keep our distance from war. War hasn't taken place on our territory. You know, it's always been somewhere else. Really, civil war is the last time that war was right here among us in a, in a significant way. I had a member in my congregation when I was uh, in Longwood uh, who had um, grown up in Poland, uh, well actually it was Germany, but it was right on the borderline and sometimes depending on who'd won the most recent war, it would be Poland or it would be Germany depending on which it was. And uh, they got toward the end of World War II and uh, the Russians were coming in from the east and the British and the Americans were coming in from the west and uh, they knew the war was lost but the Germans weren't backing down and uh, they didn't have enough soldiers to deal with the anti-tank guns and the anti-aircraft guns and so on, so they went into the high schools. And uh, they took 15-year-olds out of the high schools and brought them in, gave them just a few days training and said, okay, now you keep the Russians out. The Russians were closer and this was their responsibility. And uh, so he saw war very, very close up. There were about 35 young people in his class and uh, only four of them, to his knowledge, survived. And uh, so he said, you know, one of the problems that you have here in America is that because of the fact that this hasn't touched you so closely, it's always been over there. It's always been someone else. And even though Americans are involved and even though we're, we're saddened by the fact that Americans die on foreign soil and may even be buried on foreign soil, it is altogether different when you're occupied and uh, when all the things that come with war take place. Well, um, I'm going to uh, start off with, uh, with a little reading that was, uh, or a little bit of writing that was done by Mark Twain. And, uh, and this is called The War Prayer. And um, Mark Twain uh, wrote it between the Spanish-American War and the First World War. And the uh, Secretary of State at that time for the United States was a man by the name of John Hay. And uh, the Spanish-American War uh, was not probably the most ethical war that was ever engaged in. And, um, and it was uh, an opportunity for the United States to be more expansionist, to be more colonialist. And uh, they, they knew that they wanted to have more power and this was a way that it could be done. And uh, as a result of the war, the Philippines came under our control and Puerto Rico came under our control and Guam. And then there were other areas, even if they didn't come under our control, moved into our orbit in a more dramatic way. And so there was a lot of uh, political advantage in this and there was also a lot of economic advantage and there was a lot of status advantage because now we're a player on the world field a lot more because of it. 
And so the Secretary of State described the uh, Spanish-American War as a splendid little war. A splendid little war, and uh, Mark Twain heard that. And you know, Mark Twain had a somewhat contrarian way of looking at things. And uh, he wasn't going to allow that to stand to think that there even was such a thing as a splendid little war. And uh, so a few years after John Hay had made that, I'm sure, you know, Mark Twain was busy and this was all rolling around in his brain and he wrote the war prayer. And um, so I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to share that with you this morning. And uh, his idea was he wanted people to know what war was really like. And uh, he didn't think that most people had any comprehension of the, of the terribleness of war. And uh, so he tried to make him think about it. And also, the way it separates us and creates even stronger than otherwise might exist, an us and them mentality. And the only way that you can really go out and, uh, and, and uh, fight is to see the other person as terrible. You know, the, the, the other person has to be the enemy, but not just the enemy, an enemy that deserves what's happening to them, an enemy that deserves to be killed. The world would be better if they weren't there. And uh, so even though some places may do it more than others, there's always a lot of propaganda associated with war, and there's a always a lot of reduction of the humanity of the other side, no matter, no matter what it is. And so there are no splendid little wars. Now, there is one thing that's changed a bit, and that is because we have 24-hour cable, and uh, because we have international news that comes in so quickly and so graphically, we may understand a little bit more about the terribleness of war. For example, what's going on in Israel, what happened on October 7, and the devastation that was caused to Israel because of it, and now the ongoing devastation that's being caused to Gaza because of it. And we see it on the TV, and we recognize that it's really bad, and probably we should do something about it, and who do we speak up about? To about this and how do we protest in the right way and which direction do we protest and all that kind of thing. But we see it in the context of, of television. And so it's broken up into little segments, these reports, in which they advertise, say, medications, you know. And, uh, you know, this medication may cause diarrhea, it may cause constipation, it may cause you to gamble, it may cause you to have heart attacks, you know, it may take your life. But ask your doctor if this is the medication for you. You know, there's a certain surrealism when we watch television. You know, this isn't, this isn't real, and that surrealism kind of spreads to all that we're watching on television. And, uh, and so it becomes a non-reality, even though it's a terrible reality that we're seeing in graphic depiction, it, it doesn't really soak in, you know? It's sort of like, well, ask your doctor if, if this is what you need. Maybe a splendid little war would help you. You know, it's that same, kind of, that same kind of context in which we watch it. So Mark Twain wrote this about, uh, about 1905, 1904, something, somewhere around in there, as I said, between the Spanish-American War and, the, uh, and first, the First World War, and this is a satire. And I can imagine him writing it. So I have uh, memorized this because I found it so powerful and so interesting, but I do have a cheat sheet here so that uh, if I forget where I am or what I was supposed to say, I'll look down and, uh, and I'll cheat. Um, so it goes like this, The War Prayer by Mark Twain. It was a time of great and exalting excitement. The country was up in arms, the war was on. In every breast burned the holy fire of patriotism. And on every hand and far down the receding and fading spread of roofs and balconies, a fluttering wilderness of flags flashed in the sun. Nightly, the packed mass meetings listened, breathless, panting to patriot oratory, which stirred the deepest deeps of their hearts and which they interrupted at briefest intervals with cyclones of applause, the tears running down their cheeks the while. In the churches, pastors preached devotion to flag and country and invoked the God of battles, beseeching his aid in our good cause in outpourings of fervid eloquence that moved every listener. Sunday morning came. 
Next day, the battalions would leave for the front. The church was filled. The volunteers were there, their young eyes alight with vision, martial, martial dreams and visions of the stern advance, the gathering momentum, the rushing charge, the flashing sabers, the flight of the foe, the tumult, the enveloping smoke, the fierce pursuit, the surrender. And then back home, bronzed heroes welcomed, adored, submerged in golden seas of glory. The service proceeded. A war chapter from the Old Testament was read. The first prayer was said. Then came the long prayer. No one could remember the like of it for passionate pleading and moving and beautiful language. The burden of its supplication was that an ever merciful and benignant father of us all would Watch over our noble young soldiers and aid and comfort and encourage them in their patriotic work. An aged stranger entered and moved with slow and noiseless step up the main aisle, his eyes fixed on the minister. His long body covered with a robe that went to his feet, his head bare, his white hair descending in a frothy cataract to his shoulders, his seamy face unnaturally pale, pale even to ghastliness. He ascended to the preacher's side and stood there waiting. The stranger touched his arm, motioned him to move aside, which the startled minister did, and took his place. For some moments he looked at the spellbound audience with solemn eyes in which burned an uncanny light. Then he said in a deep voice, I come from the throne, bearing a message from Almighty God. God's servant and yours has prayed his prayer. Has he paused and taken thought? Is it one prayer? No, it is two. One uttered the other not. Both have reached the ear of him who heareth all supplications, the spoken and the unspoken. Ponder this. Keep it in mind. If you beseech a blessing from God, beware lest without intent you invoke a curse upon a neighbor at the same time. If you pray for the blessing of rain upon your crop, which needs it, by that act, you may be praying for a curse upon some neighbor's crop which doesn't need rain and can be injured by it. You have heard your servant's prayer, the uttered part of it. I am commissioned of God to put into words the other part of it, the part which the preacher and you silently in your hearts prayed silently and Ignorantly and unthinkingly, God grant that it was so. You heard these words. Grant us the victory, O Lord our God. When you have prayed for victory, you have prayed for many things that come with victory, must accompany it, cannot help but accompany it. Upon the listening spirit of God fell also the unspoken part of the prayer. He commandeth me to put it into words. Listen. O oh Lord, our Father, our young patriots, the idols of our hearts, go forth to battle. Be thou near them. With them in spirit, we also go forth from the sweet peace of our beloved firesides to smite the foe. Oh, Lord, our God, help us to tear their soldiers to bloody shreds with our shells. Help us to cover their, their smiling fields with the pale forms of their patriot dead. Help us to drown the thunder of the guns with the shrieks of their wounded writhing in pain. Help us to lay waste their humble homes. Help us to 
rend the hearts of their unoffending widows with unavailing grief. Help us to turn them out roofless with little children to wander unfriended the wastes of their desolated land in rags and hunger and thirst. Sports of the sun flames of summer and the icy winds of winter, broken in spirit, worn with travail, imploring thee for the refuge of the grave and denied it. For our sakes, who adore thee, Lord, bless their hopes and blight their lives. Protract their bitter pilgrimage, make heavy their steps, water their way with their tears, and stain the white snow with the blood of their wounded feet. We ask it in the spirit of love, <laughs> of him who is the source of love, and who is the ever faithful refuge and friend of all who are sore beset, and seek his aid with humble and contrite hearts. Amen. After a pause, ye have prayed it. If ye still desire it, speak. The messenger of the Most High waits. It was believed afterward that the man was a lunatic <laughs> because there was no sense in what he said. That's it. So that was Mark Twain's view of war, and he thought that maybe if people understood it a little more clearly, and the fact that you have to take sides like that, you have no choice but doing that kind of thing. And uh, so he wrote that satire, and I'd never heard it. I, uh, a few years ago, was at a, an event that was sponsored by one of our politicians, and I happened to be talking to a UCF professor. And, uh, and anyway, he told me about this, this thing that Mark Twain had written, and he said, you should read it. It is really worthwhile. And uh, when I read it, I said, it's really worthwhile. <laughs> That's good. You know, that really, that really says it. Anyway, um, I want to move very quickly uh, just through kind of my own life experience. Um, we had the draft when I turned 18. We had to register for the draft. I'm a, a Seventh-day Adventist heritage. You know, my parents were Seventh-day Adventists. My grandparents, my great-grandparents, you know, we come from a long line of Seventh-day Adventists. And the recommendation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was at that time, and I'll back up just a moment, there were three categories that you could register for the draft under at that time. You could be 1A, that meant you were available. You'd go in and do whatever job they asked you to do. You could be 1O, which meant that you were a conscientious objector, a pacifist. Or you could be 1AO, which meant that you were available for military service, but you objected to the idea of bearing arms and taking life. And so you would be put into a non-combat, non well, not non-combat, I shouldn't say that. Um, it would be, it, you, wouldn't carry, you wouldn't carry a gun. And uh, usually Seventh-day Adventists went into the military in the medical, as the, as the uh, medical corps. And uh, so that was what was recommended for me, uh, because that's what the church, that was their recommendation. I will say to the church's credit, they didn't demand what one did. Uh, if you chose to carry a gun, you know, they didn't kick you out, they didn't censure you or discipline you or anything like that. And if you chose to be an objector, but they had very strong feelings about the idea that it was the middle ground was the better way to go. So I signed up that way that uh, I would be available to go and uh, that I would, uh, I would object to the idea of carrying a gun. So I would be non-combatant as far as the, the gun was concerned. Well, uh, then I went off to college and uh, actually studying for the ministry. So I was listed as a theology major and uh, I could get a deferment because I was a theology student. And so you got this ministerial deferment. I don't remember exactly how it was lettered and numbered, you know, but that was easy to get. They, ministers didn't have, to, uh, didn't have to go to war. And so uh, I thought about that, and that gave me a little bit of uh, concern. I thought, you know, I think it's important for ministers to have an understanding of what their congregations would be going through. So here, if I can kind of be over here and be sheltered and mollycoddled, so to speak, I'm not going to be a very understanding pastor of people who are wrestling with these issues. So I decided, forget the deferment. 
I immediately decided that. And uh, then I, I went to college and I took world history and I began to have doubts about what was going on in Vietnam and how it had all come about and uh, you know the essence of what the war is. And uh, the United States Supreme Court had made a decision that you either had to be against all war or you couldn't be against war. Uh, you know, and, uh, and that doesn't quite necessarily fit in with, uh, you know, my thinking, but those were the options. You either had to uh, object to war in general, but you couldn't say, I don't like the, you know, the Vietnam War, or I didn't like the Korean War, or World War II, or whatever. You couldn't pick and choose. So then as I studied it, I said, you know, I think I, <clears throat> I just don't think I can justify war at all. And the way I thought about it was that I spent quite a bit of time reading and studying and doing research on this, and I looked at the U.S. manual for soldiers and, you know, sort of the different roles that were played and how important it was. Each of these contributors was essential. And uh, so you might not think of it, but the communications person, you know, that's essential. You've got, to, you've got to have somebody providing the food. You've got to have somebody taking care of the vehicles to make sure that they're operating. You know, you need all kinds of people to make this big machine work. And uh, <clears throat> the idea of saving life as a medic was something that was very important and needed to be there. And it was going to be there whether the people who were doing it were doing it because they had an objection to carrying a gun or because they were just doing it. You know, they just happened to be picked and put into it. And uh, so I, I thought about it and I, you know, really wrestled with this. And, uh, and uh, I said, uh, you know, I, I just don't like this idea of, of being part of the war machine. You know, that, that's problematic to me. And, uh, and I, I kind of thought of it this way. If, and I, when I wrote a letter requesting to have my draft status changed from being 1AO to just 1O, an objector, a pacifist, uh, I explained, you know, if a group of bank robbers uh, were robbing a bank and I happened to be an EMT and uh, I came by, you know, where they'd been robbing the bank and one of them had gotten shot and I rendered first aid and did all that I could to keep him alive, I don't think I would be an accomplice to the bank robbery. But if the robbers came to me and said, we're going to rob a bank and it's pretty dangerous and uh, we would really appreciate it if you'd be standing on the street corner, <laughs> you know, just in case we need your services as an EMT, that kind of puts it in a different category. And I said, uh, I, I kind of look at this the same way. And, uh, and so I asked to be an objector, a, a pacifist. And to do that, I had to then, you know, write out what, what it, why it was that I believed like I believed. And uh, there were, it wasn't a popular thing to do, let's put it that way. You know, there may have been a, a lot of, uh, uh, discussion about the war and uh, whether it was good or bad, but people who didn't want to go into the military, uh, it didn't elevate their status, let's put it that way. So I needed not only to send my own argument of why I wanted to make this draft status change, but I also, um, I also had to get some references. And so I asked three or four people to write letters of reference, and I, I sent to them the material, you know, that I had prepared for the draft, and uh, for the draft board. And uh, interestingly, and I think this is really important, this stands out in my mind in a big way. Every person who I asked to write a reference for me disagreed with me. There was nobody who was saying, yeah, go, you know, go for it. Every one of them disagreed with me. But every one of them wrote a letter on my behalf to say, this is what he believes. And it makes no difference what I believe. This is what he believes, and we think that he's a person who stands up for his beliefs. And uh, therefore, we would ask that you take seriously his request. I'm not sure that would happen in today's world. You know, I'm not sure that I could go to people and that they would be willing to write a letter, you know, to support somebody who they disagreed with. Well, let's make this all kind of short now. It's been long. <laughs> um, I've thought about it a lot since. And, you know, even when I wrote my letter to the draft board, I said, uh, you know, there are issues. These are not e simple issues. You know, this is not easy to decide. And uh, I said, you know, the question would be asked, what if my family were attacked? 
you know, would I use lethal force to try to protect my family if I had the opportunity to use lethal force? And I said, these are not simple, these are not simple things. And uh, so I continued to study. I didn't stop just because that was passed. And actually what happened then was I got a high lottery number, so it never came up. It all became kind of a moot issue. But I thought it was a, an issue that I needed to go through on a moral plane you know, to make a decision of where I stood on this, particularly if I was going to minister to people who have to make complicated moral decisions. I've got to have an understanding of what they're going through and not just live out here in a little insulated ivory tower, you know, that, that's got it made. So I've read a lot more and I've studied a lot more and I've talked to a lot more people and I probably have moved a little bit more to the, what was originally uh, first propounded by the Catholics called the just war theory. And I don't call it the just war theory because I'm not sure there's such a thing as a just war. I would modify that a bit and say justifiable maybe. You know, it's a sloppy, mean, dirty, nasty war. But it might be the best option we have in a field of bad options. You know, it might be that that's the pro-life decision to make in a field where if it was, you know, any different, if you could change the equation in any way, you wouldn't do it. But, you know, we kind of have our backs to the wall. And uh, so I have a lot more sympathy for the... Uh, for the just war theory, and not only did the Catholics develop this, but then ethicists have picked up on it and refined it and so on. I actually would prefer to call it selective non-pacifism. In other words, the, um, you know, as opposed, to the, as opposed to a just war or even a justifiable war, my default setting would, would need to be pacifism. You know, we want to avoid war, you know, in any way we can, unless we're right to the, you know, where it really is a life and death survival of our, of our nation uh, and the people in our nation, you know, with pacifism always needs to be the default setting. But there may be a time where the circumstances call for this selective override, where, where we commit to selective non-pacifism. And that doesn't mesh with what the Supreme Court has said, you know, that you have to be totally against war because I don't believe that every war is the same. And uh, so that's my story and I'm sticking to it, but uh, it obviously is a changing story. It has, it's an evolving story and that's kind of where I am right now. You know, the idea of selective non-pacifism. I'm glad for the steps I went through I'm glad for the moral wrestlings that I encountered and you know, what I had to do to, uh, to get to where I am today. And I really want everybody to think about it and just because we don't have a draft, you know, just because we're not forced to go to the military like we have been in the past, I think we need to think this through very carefully as you know, what does my inner light, my inner moral compass tell me I should be doing and uh, we shouldn't deal with it in a, in a cavalier and uh, an indifferent way. It really is a huge issue because it says a lot about how we really view life when the chips are down. So thank you very much. And, uh, and don't forget the war prayer. It's worth, worth reading. Okay, thank you. Great to be here. Thank you so much. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Closing music. Stand up and sing with me, Spirit of Life. It's number 123 in your hymnal, but the words will certainly be up here on the screen if that's all you need. Spirit of life, come unto me, string in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, 
Blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free, spirit of life. Come to me, come to me. May the firmness of the earth be yours and yours and yours. May the flow of the water be yours and yours and yours. May the freedom of the air be yours and yours and yours. May the fierceness of the fire be yours and yours and yours. May all the gifts of this life, the below and the above, be with you now and remain with you and you and you, always. From Eric Williams. Do we have a postlude today? No? <laughs> Not today. So, I set you free to seek out coffee, or tea, or cookies, or conversations, or whatever it is you're after.